Hello, good evening. Welcome to Navarra Live. My name is Aaron Bastani. Tonight we have the immense satisfaction of being joined by Helena, aka No Justice MTG on YouTube and Twitch. Coming up later tonight, Julian Assange has won more time in his efforts to prevent extradition to the United States. There's been a very strange political advert from the Conservatives, you might have seen it. And some serious allegations of vote rigging have appeared within the Labour Party in regards to their candidate selection process. Stay tuned for all of that. Some really great stories tonight. Since the UN Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza passed, global reaction has come thick and fast. At a press conference in Tehran today, Hamas leader Ismail Haniya said Israel is failing to achieve any of its military or strategic goals and is facing unprecedented political isolation since its invasion of Gaza. He also noted that the US appeared no longer able to impose its will on the international community. Rather, it appears the US has bowed to the will of that same international community after its ambassador for the first time abstained from, rather than vetoed, a ceasefire proposal brought by another country. Now, that change in the political climate appears to have encouraged Hamas. The organization has now rejected a US deal on the Israeli hostages it holds, saying that it doesn't meet their demands. On Saturday, Israel agreed to a compromise proposed by the US about the number of Palestinian prisoners it would release as part of a deal. Israeli media reported that the government agreed to release between seven and 800 Palestinian prisoners in return for 40 hostages. But Hamas has now rejected that deal, telling mediators it doesn't go far enough. In particular, it doesn't include a complete withdrawal of IDF troops from Gaza, nor what Hamas calls a real exchange of prisoners. In other words, the deal that Israel agreed with the US doesn't offer the return of enough Palestinian prisoners in exchange for the hostages. The calculus has changed. And Hamas also says that it doesn't guarantee that Palestinians in Gaza will be able to return to their homes, which is another key condition of their demands. In response, Israeli PM Benjamin Netanyahu released this statement. Hamas's position clearly proves that Hamas is not interested in continuing negotiations for a deal and is an unfortunate testimony to the damage created by the Security Council's decision. Hamas once again rejected any American compromise proposal and repeated its extreme demands. An immediate end to the war, a complete withdrawal of the IDF from the Gaza Strip, and Romanian power so that it could repeat the massacre of October 7th again and again, as it had promised to do. Hamas has refused any American compromise proposal and also welcomed the Security Council's decision. Israel will not submit to Hamas's delusional demands and will continue to act to achieve all the goals of the war, to release all the hostages, to destroy Hamas's military and governmental capabilities, and to ensure that Gaza will no longer pose a threat to Israel. Now, those are big words for a prime minister whose key ally, the United States, appears to be losing patience with his tactics. And it's not just the current US administration that's had enough. Donald Trump had these words for Israel in an interview with the right-wing newspaper Israel Hayom. You have to finish up your war. You have to finish it up. You've got to get it done. Israel has to be very careful because you're losing a lot of the world. You're losing a lot of support. Typically Trumpian in terms of how pithy what he says there, but it's a very meaningful political shift. Donald Trump is a man who went out of his way to harm the Palestinian cause during his last presidency, even moving the US embassy to Jerusalem and brokering the Abraham Accords. That was, of course, the deal that began to normalize relations between Israel and Arab nations in the region against the wishes of the Palestinians. So when he tells Israel enough's enough, you know they're in trouble. Netanyahu appears to be facing trouble at home too, with a distinct change in tone in the Israeli media since the UN ceasefire resolution passed. Left-leaning Haritz has been generally critical of the Prime Minister, but today its editorial was even more stuck. Netanyahu has become Israel's agent of destruction, reads the headline. It goes on to describe the Prime Minister as, quote, a burden for Israel. Israel gets closer to the abyss every day, said the center-right Jerusalem Post. 
arguing that Netanyahu's ineffective slogans and leadership are pushing Israel closer to disaster. And he compares Netanyahu's regime to Sinwar's dream. Yahua Sinwar is the head of Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Israel's popular news blog, Ynet, accused Netanyahu of putting the country at risk to maintain his right-wing base and saying that, quote, every additional day that he sits in his chair, our international situation worsens. And Netanyahu's government is increasingly isolated internationally and increasingly mistrusted at home. So a new report from the UN Special Rapporteur on Palestine will have been an unwelcome addition to his woes this morning. This was Francesca Albanese speaking at the UN's Human Rights Council. I find that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the threshold indicating the commission of the crime of genocide against Palestinians as a group in Gaza has been met. Specifically, Israel has committed three acts of genocide with the requisite intent, causing seriously, serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group. Albanese went on to call the genocide in Gaza, quote, the most extreme stage of a long-standing settler colonial process of erasure of the native Palestinians. In her report called Anatomy of a Genocide, Albanese also demands an immediate arms embargo on Israel. Helena, so much to talk about. That Security Council conclusion is possibly a game changer with regards to the Netanyahu premiership, isn't it? On one hand, you've got Joe Biden, some of the most historically pro-Israel kind of presidents in terms of his history with regards to US-Israel relations as a senator, as a president, as a kind of high up member of the Democratic Party, regardless of his level of office, relenting, relenting on his, his insistence on being pro-Israel to allow this resolution to pass. Because again, what we've been saying for months and months at this point is that the only way to get Israel to relent on its genocidal campaign is to pressure or to get pressure to be applied by its allies within the West. And we have to do that internally. And clearly the DNC and the Democratic Party have made the calculation that if they don't stop people from seeing the kind of ridiculous images that they're seeing on their phones, the absolutely heartbreaking images that they're seeing on their social media feeds of what's happening in Gaza using their weapons and their money, they know that their election chances are going down. We've seen the polls still in favor of Trump overall, even though the Democrats are winning a lot of key Senate elections. So there's clearly been a calculation to maintain power by relenting, by relenting to this kind of unprecedented level of anti-Israel sentiment amongst the American public for the Biden administration, specifically him, not necessarily the Democratic Party, but him specifically as their presidential candidate in this coming up election later on this year. And on the flip side of this, on the flip side of all of this, we have Netanyahu, a man who is also very, very desperate to maintain power so desperate to maintain power, even himself as an ideological Zionist, putting his own ideological project in huge amounts of stress, under huge amounts of potential collapse, because of his own personal desire to stay in power. He knows that as soon as the war finishes, as soon as his time being the leader of the, the essentially the person who's commissioning the armed forces in Israel to be able to continue his genocidal war against the Palestinians, the moment that stops, the moment any of these deals are acquiesced to on either side, uh, sorry, or sorry, on both sides rather, collectively, his time in office is over. And of course, his time of some level of personal immunity for his own personal misdeeds is over. And so what's he do? We had a position where Israel were having normalization, as you say, with Arab states with regards to the Abraham Accords, and he's incinerated all of that. He's become, he's created essentially an international pariah state of Israel, as we see chorus of voices around the world calling for an end to the mass slaughter of Palestinian civilians. And really and truly, all of that's broken down to the point where he's losing de facto support of the United States, one of the few allies they had left. And all of this, all of this is so that he stays in power. That's his main ideological goal here. And it's really interesting to see what happens to people when they've been cornered with regards to their own personal their own personal political career goals. So that's an interesting parallel you have on both sides of this one. What I will say with regards to ceasefire deal we were talking about before, and I do think it's unfortunate that we are not at least seeing some amount of an acquiescence on both sides towards a hostage exchange here, both the people in administrative detention in Israel, for example, and those who are being held hostage, again, a war crime 
by Hamas and the PIJ over on the Gaza Strip. Because, of course, what we really want to see is a ceasefire deal that ends the war and does see the IDF leave, as Hamas have been demanding, but for a release of all of the hostages that they have, as well as, of course, a prisoner exchange too. So seeing Hamas becoming more willing to play hardball in response is a disappointing development for me personally, as I would like to see everybody who is innocent here at least go free and be an, be an end to this nightmare that people have been put through at this uh, for the last six months at this point. It's really interesting. If you'd said to somebody on, you know, October the 8th, um, by the spring of next year, Israel will be, a, like you say, an international pariah state. They would have lost the support of America, the United States. Given they just experienced this awful, shocking thing, I don't think anybody would have believed you. But that, that is the extent to which the Israeli government, and particularly Netanyahu, have overplayed their hand. Um, and, you know, quickly... Uh, we can disparage or criticize democracy. And there are obviously many features of politics in the US or the UK where it's not democratic. You could argue in many aspects, it's a managed democracy from media ownership to the billionaire class buying um, political debate, but also sometimes literally buying politicians to the closed nature of the two-party system. But the United States response now is directly driven by concerns about its domestic electorate. That counts for something. And that's worth fighting for. And that's democracy. So it's not always perfect. Uh, it's not even always necessarily observable. But it can make a difference. Um, and that really should not be ignored. A high court in London has delayed Julian Assange's extradition to the United States for now. In February, Assange's lawyers asked the High Court for permission to appeal the UK government's 2022 decision to extradite Assange to the US. The court hasn't granted that permission, but it has said that the US must give it further assurances that Assange's rights will be respected and his safety guaranteed if he's extradited. But when lawyers for Assange presented his case last month, they argued he would face a, quote, flagrant denial of justice if extradited across the Atlantic. And they requested permission to appeal on nine grounds. Now, the court has just dismissed six of those, but said on three of them that Assange has a genuine prospect of success at appeal. Bizarrely, the court has also said that the word of the US government on each of those grounds could be enough to allow the extradition to go ahead regardless. They've asked the US to assure them Assange will not face the death penalty, that he'll be able to rely on free speech rights in any defense in the US, and that his status as a non-US citizen won't prejudice his case. A lawyer, Stella Assange, who is also Julian Assange's wife, spoke outside the court after that ruling was delivered. It's astounding. The courts recognize that Julian is exposed to a flagrant denial of his freedom of expression rights that he is being discriminated against on the basis of his nationality, an Australian, and that he remains exposed to the death penalty. And yet, what the courts have done have been to invite a political intervention from the United States to send a letter saying it's all okay. I find this astounding. Five years into this case, the United States has managed to show the court that their case remains an attack on press freedom, an attack on Julian's life. Assurances from the US over Assange's safety might be pretty hard to take seriously. Under Donald Trump's presidency, the CIA discussed various plans to assassinate or kidnap the founder of WikiLeaks. And while Joe Biden might be prepared to make those assurances, the prospect of a second Trump presidency next year could make them short-lived. But the High Court refused to consider evidence of the CIA's plans in their decision because an earlier judge had already dismissed that evidence. The court said this. The judge took account of evidence that the CIA had planned to kidnap Mr. Assange from the Ecuadorian embassy. She concluded that this was not related to the extradition proceedings and that it had not been shown that any risk would arise if he was extradited to the United States. One of the world's most malign intelligence agencies wants to kidnap you from the embassy of a sovereign country, Ecuador, situated in a third state, Britain. But that's irrelevant to the question 
of risk. Other than that, they totally believe in the rule of law and due process. Now, the High Court has given the US three weeks to issue the assurance it has asked for. If it fails on any of those three grounds, Assange will be granted permission to appeal. But if the court is convinced, the extradition will likely go ahead. Here's Stella Assange again. This case is a retribution. It is a signal to all of you that if you expose the interests that are driving war, they will come after you. They will put you in prison and they will try to kill you. Julian is just a few, min- a few days away from the fifth anniversary of his arrest and imprisonment in Belmarsh prison. He has been in Belmarsh for five years without conviction, and the charges against him are to punish him for publishing the truth, for publishing evidence of the war crimes committed by the country that is trying to extradite him. Now, the UK courts have invited the United States to issue assurances. The Biden administration should not issue assurances. They should drop this shameful case that should never have been brought. Julian should never have been imprisoned for a single day. This is a shame on every democracy. In the US, some politicians are also working to drop the case against Assange. In December, eight members of the House of Representatives introduced a bill calling for Congress to recognize that journalistic activities are protected by the First Amendment and calling for the prosecution of Assange to stop. Sponsors include members from both sides of the political divide, and you would think it's quite straightforward that journalism is covered by the rights to freedom of speech. Elena, there was a few things there that I, I thought were really powerful, particularly from that second clip we just showed uh, from Stella Assange. The first is that, I mean, it's easy to forget this. He has been in Belmarsh, which is a category of prison. It's a serious place. He's been in Belmarsh prison for almost five years, and he's not been found guilty of anything. He's not gone, gone through any sort of legal process. There are, there are questions about whether or not he, you know, he could have been subjected to all of this. He could have been a free man in London or wherever he would have been in the UK, or at the very least, he could have been in a Category C, Category D prison. I mean, it seems pretty inarguable that this is designed to be punitive. Oh, 100%. This is a gigantic state overreach. I think if there's one thing that I have a lot of common ground with a lot of libertarian types on, as you can see in terms of where we sit on the left and the kind of the bipartisan agreement with other people on the right in America in the House of Representatives with regards to this, this fundamental belief in protections against overarching powers of state, on part of, of the state, sorry, against you for essentially trying to undermine the state specifically is where we share a lot of common ground. That's why you see this particular bill trying to go through the House of Representatives, as we've seen. Very small numbers, but at the very least, there are, there are people there on both sides of the political divide, divide understanding how these kind of basic rights should never really be infringed on. Again, this is somebody who put his whole life on jeopardy, or his whole life on the line, to get us informed about what was being done in our name, with our tax money, Essentially, the main thing that he's getting done on here is publishing something that was should be really exposed. This is what journalists do. They expose things that otherwise would have been covered up so that it is in the public interest. And this is being charged on an espionage charge. If you want to get him for hacking or whatever, there was a point was being made that for hacking the documents, then you know, that's a five-year charge or whatever for some people for hacking government documents. But the publishing is specifically what they're getting him on. And again, this is what happens to you. This is what happens to people who undermine Western hegemony, who undermine Western states outside of what they believe shouldn't be in the public interest or shouldn't be in the public domain, for them to understand the real role that their security services play around the world, committing war crimes, no less. And this is the kind of thing that you would expect from the Cheka or the UDBA. And at this point, this is happening in Western democracy. So lock somebody up. And a lot of time in solitary confinement as well. Dennis Varoufakis has been visiting Julian Assange. And this is essentially tantamount to torture with no charge, as far as I'm concerned, in colloquial terms. And this is, the, this is a, as has been said very succinctly, this is pure retribution, pure retribution on somebody for undermining for undermining state power, 
And I think, again, this is where I share a lot of ground with libertarians on this. And this is where free speech protections, such as the First Amendment, are indeed, should be, indeed be somewhat sacrosanct. Again, because it's specifically about those speaking out against the state and for those who will not be punished by the state for speaking out. That is the fundamental basis of freedom of speech. And we get, we get a lot of discourse around that phrase online a lot about your know, cancellations, all this, about what people say on social media. And we forget that actually the true nature of it is ensuring that the state cannot punish you for criticizing it. And that's what's happening to Mr. Assange right now. And that was something that was hinted at, or she, she overtly said it actually, Stella Assange, that this could be any of you. Um, and th this treatment of Julian is a warning to all of you. And I think that's quite obvious. Um, and it's important, I think, given events recently in, in Gaza, the kinds of videos that people have seen have been radicalized by, that have shifted the, the, the global debate around this stuff. You know, we talked about Israel burning decades of goodwill in, in six months. That is because of videos of the type that 15 years ago were being shown to the world by WikiLeaks, war crimes, um, drone strikes, or you know, the gunning down of, of civilians in places like Iraq or Afghanistan. The exact same stuff that's now appearing in your Instagram feed or on Twitter or on Telegram, because technology was different 15 years ago, those were precisely the same stories being revealed by WikiLeaks. Um, and the reason why Assange is being treated the way he is is because, as we're now seeing with Israel, showing that kind of reality has an incredibly important political effect. And I think, actually, if you were to look at anybody over the last 25 years, what single individual has undermined belief, faith, credibility for the Western alliance, their foreign policy choices, how they behave? I mean, clearly, Julian Assange is right at the top. I mean, I would say that's that's an argument to give him a Pulitzer Prize, not chuck him in prison. And to finish, he has not been um, convicted or has not been alleged to have broken any laws in this country, any laws. And yet the taxpayer in this country, the British taxpayer, has paid for Julian Assange to stay in a category A prison, very, very hostile place to live for five years. He's not broken any laws. Nobody thinks he's broken any laws in this country. And yet the taxpayer is paying for that. Really remarkable. And there's a great line, but it's true. It's more expensive to send somebody to jail than to Yale. You're looking at about 50, 60,000 pounds a year, I think, the last time I checked, to send somebody to prison. Why are we doing this? I think you can have your own thoughts. Mine are, we're essentially doing it because the US has asked us to do it. And we don't really have an independent foreign policy in this country. The allegation of stolen elections is generally something you'll hear from across the Atlantic. Of course, it's a serious offence wherever it happens. It violates criminal law. So there needs to be a threshold to prove it's actually taken place because the consequences for those guilty of it are rightly severe. Lawyers acting for Sam Tarry, presently the Labour MP for Ilford South, have written to the Labour Party headquarters over claims that an online voting system, a non-voter, has been used to undermine left-wing candidates. In other words, that underhand tactics are at play. Now, a non-voter is a software system used for holding online votes by local Labour Party branches to determine who will be their candidate for the next election. Sam Tarry lost to Jazz Atwal in a selection vote in October 2022, and he's been disputing the result ever since. He says the reason he lost is because of a non voter whose results he can't see and subsequently doesn't trust. The Telegraph reports this. Sam Tarry is now considering issuing legal proceedings to force Labour to publish the non voter records from his selection or even to get an injunction to block Mr. Atwal from being the official Ilford South candidate. Trade unions are helping Mr. Tarry raise tens of thousands of pounds, which will help fund legal action if an agreement with the party is not reached. Meanwhile, a second Labour MP, Beth Winter, who represents Kynon Valley, has been exchanging legal letters with the party over how an only voter was used in her selection race. Ms. Winter sought to become the candidate in a newly created Welsh seat last summer, but lost. Her lawyers wrote to the party raising concerns about the use of the non voter system both before and after the result. This week, she has written to senior figures in Welsh Labour, widening her complaints beyond online voting and demanding an investigation. So at least two MPs think there might be foul play at work. 
And that's only compounded by goings-on in the constituency of Croydon East. Croydon is a stronghold for the Labour right. It's where the constituencies, um, it's where there are several constituencies which host uh, people on the Labour right. And Croydon is where, of course, the party general secretary, David Evans, is based. There, the selection is now being investigated by the Metropolitan Police's cyber crime team because of potential irregularities. Here's the really funny thing. A non-evoter was developed by people in, you guessed it, Croydon. A non-evoter is provided by Henson IT Solutions Limited. Only two directors are cited for that company at Company's House, Madeline and Mark Henson who members in Croydon say are both firmly on the party's right. They're allegedly allies of the General Secretary. Indeed, Maddie Henson is a Labour councillor and Croydon's ceremonial mayor. That's right, the Labour Party is buying software from a Labour councillor to conduct online voting. No formal procurement process, no competitive tendering, And that's all the more strange since another system exists, Civica Election Services, which is used by dozens of organisations across the UK, including both the other major parties. So why is Labour using a different system to everyone else and one built by an allegedly right-wing Labour councillor? Is it technically better? That's hard to believe. That same Telegraph piece goes on to say this. In one selection, a moderate candidate won just 10% of the in-person vote, but 62% of the Anuni voter online vote, according to a breakdown shared by local party figures. There is no suggestion the Anuni voter system is inherently flawed or faulty, but the lack of transparency has raised concerns that it's open to abuse. Regional Labour figures running the online votes are able to see who has voted, a piece of information that would be critical to campaigns trying to turn out supporters in tight races. Independent tellers are not usually given access to monitor the online voter system during the votes, meaning there is no outside oversight of the live online voting process. In response to this story, Beth Winter MP has said this, the ongoing controversy around online voter voting software understandably leads to a lack of trust and confidence in Labour Party procedures. Understatement of the century. Continued use of the software at risk bringing the party into disrepute. In order to restore some trust in the party, there must be an independent review of the use of an voter in internal selection campaigns, including the selection process in Merthyr Tidville and Upper Kynon. In addition, Labour should end its use of an online voter and commission a trusted independent balloting administrator whose ballots stand up to scrutiny, such as Civica, formerly Electoral Reform Services, as the trade unions do, to conduct its internal ballots, including parliamentary selections in future. Now, most explicitly of all, and this really is incredible. The investigative journalist Michael Crick has said that, quote, many selection contests have been fiddled and fixed by party officials. Fiddled and fixed. Not very ambiguous, is it? And bear in mind, Michael Crick is no fan of the left. And you want to hear something even more outlandish. Well, it turns out that the Labour councillor who co-owns the part, the company which developed an voter itself was recently selected as a candidate in the forthcoming London elections. And she was selected in a process that used, you guessed it, a nonny voter. You really do hope that Scotland Yard are putting resources into this because something really fishy seems to be taking place. Here's someone else from the Labour left speaking out. Martin Abrams is a spokesperson for Momentum and a Labour councillor highly critical of the nonny voter system. What we're witnessing is a political scandal of potentially epic proportions. So we already know about the mass blockings of local left-wing candidates in Labour's parliamentary selections, you know, often denying local members a free and fair choice. But what we're seeing with this scandal is allegations of outright uh, voter manipulation Um, using online voting as a factional tool. And what we read 
uh, and heard about in the, the Telegraph report and the recent Croydon case, it points to something even worse. You know, that's the poss possibility of systematic voter rigging of Labour's parliamentary selections. The Met Police's cybercrime unit are looking into what's been happening, happening in Croydon. And that was for the Croydon East, which is a new uh, parliamentary constituency. And there's very serious allegations of data manipulation there, where someone or some persons uh, have um, allegedly gone into Labour's uh, database and manipulated the data of local members. Since the COVID-19 pandemic happened, a lot of Labour's uh, uh, meetings have gone online and a lot of their internal votes for uh, party selections, for, um, you know, like CLP elections and Labour branch elections have taken place using a system called a non-e-voter. That is the online voting system that is, is almost uniformly used across the Labour Party to, uh, to, to operate their, their, their candidate selections and internal voting. And, you know, it, 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 apparently this uh, voting system was procured without any tendering process. And uh, there's allegations that the General Secretary, David Evans, is very close to the people that run and operate this online voting system. So there's clearly questions that need to be answered uh, at, 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 that have been raised by local media outlets like Inside Croydon that deserve a lot of credit for um, for highlighting what's been happening with this system. Momentum has three key demands for the Labour Party. One, they need to launch an immediate independent KC-led investigation into these allegations. Uh, two, they need to suspend the use of the anonymous voter system until that investigation is carried out. And three, they should be looking at a, a, a wholly independent system to run their, uh, their, their online voting. You know, a lot of people have lost complete trust with online voting and having online meetings, which really damages accessibility for meetings. I know a lot of uh, branches, uh, Labour Party branches, that simply won't run online meetings anymore because they cannot trust these meetings to be run in a free and fair way. You know, they're running meetings where only um, uh, in-person meetings are allowed. And, you know, that really does place barriers in terms of accessibility. But if you can't trust the Labour Party to run online meetings, then that's the place where we're at. So I would, I would really, really call on the Labour Party to ensure that these demands are met and that uh, Labour Party members um, can uh, have full trust in the process and the selections that are taking place for what are, is almost certainly going to be the next uh, government running the country. That to me is the really important part here. You've got a political party which will be probably administering a country of 68 million people less than 12 months from now. And there are huge questions about how they run internal democracy. They'll be in charge of your rights. They'll be in charge of national elections. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. And I personally find it remarkable that all the running, as we were just told there on this story, has really been made by Inside Croydon and, and Squawkbox. A huge story. The Telegraph is now catching up, but this has been out there for a really long time. And I want to reiterate this. The tellers in these elections, the tellers, they are responsible for, to some extent, you know, ensuring that there's an there's a effective um, an efficient process with regards to selecting a candidate, the tellers cannot see any of this data with an honor voter. None of it. But Labour Party bureaucrats have access to certain things that basically nobody else can see. So you're taking power away from CLPs, you're taking power away from election tellers, and you're centralising it with the party. And I find that really extraordinary, the, um, the, the sort of snippet we got from that Telegraph story. There are selections happening where candidates win and they get 10%, they get 10% of the people who turn up to vote. 10% and you win because of a non voter. I, I, it's possible, of course it's possible, but it raises huge questions. Particularly when at the same time, we saw in Croydon with that selection, um, dozens of people's details were changed prior to the vote. And by the way, the favoured candidate for that uh, constituency pulled out last week the, in terms of the, the constituency that's now being investigated by the cyber crimes team. One of the candidates pulled out. Was he involved? We don't know. That, that's purely um, circumstantial. Like much of this is, 
But at the very least, I think that um, compounds the demand that was put forward there of some kind of inquiry and for Labour to stop using the software. This is not industry standard. It's not off the shelf. Very, very, very fishy. Helena, this is such a big story. I know we say it a lot. Um, it's interesting the Telegraph's covered it. The Mail covered it too. But my God, it really matters if the next government is potentially rigging internal elections and disenfranchising people. I mean, it's it's quite frankly absurd that it's not being covered. I say absurd, it's very obvious why it's not being covered really and truly, but it should be. It, it's silly that it hasn't been, but we all know exactly why it hasn't been. Because as you said, this was at one point in the very recent past, the biggest political party in Europe. Under Jeremy Corbyn, it was a gigantic political party with huge amounts of you know, what international uh, burdens put upon them if they come into office at some point in the future. And if this is something that they can't be trusted on, this raises serious, serious questions. Now, I always am sceptical when people talk about vote rigging. I always think it's very sceptical. There can be people who are sore losers. I'm especially sceptical in the case of Sam Tarry when it was known already that Jazz Athwal was a popular candidate in the constituency and there was a lot of chicanery going on in the original selection process when it came to that particular constituency of people being accused of things at the last minute. But nevertheless, nevertheless, that's all by the by, it's all in the past now. When it comes to the specific instance of the current level, so of this potential for irregularities in terms of the system being used for these internal selections. Obviously, it's an ongoing police investigation, so I don't want to be make any specific statements here. But again, why? Why are they not using industry standard? Why are they not making it open and honest to people? Why is it that the tellers don't have access? These are all questions people really do need to be asking. And all of this is within the broader discussion that we have about the, about the, the NEC's kind of dirty pack of tricks that they've been using across candidate selections all across the country. We saw it blow up in their face in Rochdale, where the shortlist was essentially tried to be a way of forcing their preferred candidate into the into being the PPC. And then they elected somebody who was from somewhere else who people didn't really know. And then it came out with all of these things, then became a, a national scandal for them. And then we've seen the meddling on shortlists to get anybody who they think might not be loyal to the top of the party. Like people think this is all about ideology, and I think that's part of that, but I think that's downwind of the fact that what they're trying to do in the Labour HQ is to try and ensure, or at least from you know, in the leader of the opposition, they're trying to ensure that they have true party loyalty to the leadership specifically with, with across all parliamentary candidates. They can't have anybody who doesn't toe the line of what Starmer and co want to be doing at the moment. They've seen what's been happening on the Conservative benches with rebel MPs and internal groupings and factional war, and it's obviously made the Conservatives look terrible. So they're trying to ensure by excluding people it's especially in terms of shortlists, because we know this happens, right? We know for certain they've been excluding the people they don't want on the list from shortlists to ensure that they have a grouping of people who are in Parliament who answer very specifically to Keir Starmer's top teams. We've also seen this in the story that we reported on a couple of weeks ago with regards to this plan to have mission boards at the top of government. So it's not like the cabinet structure that we have, essentially centralising a lot of power on policy in terms of you know, Pat McFadden, Rachel Reeves, Angela Rayner, Keir Starmer, right at the top of the party, getting rid of party democracy, ensuring that when they do policy, that's all contracted down to the Tony Blair Institute to labour together, to the Resolution Foundation, to try and manage the membership, treat them as something to, a problem to manage rather than people to include. We saw at the bus up at the MP, we saw at the bus stop at the NPF where unions were disempowered from trying to set policy. Again, all centralised at the top of the party, the Starmer Politburo, if you will, as I like to call them in a, a more and a less kind of serious manner. But, but I think this is a, a really important case we're here, that if it turns out that these things are being done very specifically by insiders on the side of the party, again, there's no evidence yet that that's happened necessarily, but there was obviously the suspicions that this has happened. And this is just another part of the line that we've seen from the Labour Party in trying to centralise power and that's dangerous. That's very dangerous. We've already seen the kind of levels of authoritarianism that people within the top of the Labour Party have been capable of. And what's crazy, what's crazy about all of this? I started off by saying, well, we all know why this hasn't been reported on. Because imagine, cast your mind back five years ago, six years ago, 
If there was something like this happening with Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party, with the left in ascendancy, where they were deselecting right wing candidates, where they were using uh, some proprietary software that or what was it that was kind of bespoke and wasn't being used by other people that had been tendered from somebody who was also within the party within their faction, the press would have been all over this. It would be called the Stalinist purge. It would have been called the rise of the Corbyn's checker. Does that get covered in the same way when somebody from the Labour right does it? Silence. Absolute silence. Tumbleweed. Because again, disenfranchising the left is fine. We are seen by our journalistic establishment as being illegitimate political actors. The Mail and the Telegraph will pick it up because they think that Starmer is a pinko commie socialist, whatever. They think that because he's red, he's from the wrong team. So they'll attack him regardless. But anybody outside of that who doesn't really mind the idea of a neoliberal Labour Party coming to power, crickets. No coverage of this at all, despite the fact that it's absolutely flagrant, the, even outside of what's going on here, the, the, the potential, the allegations that are being made with this specific internal voting mechanism. Outside of that, with all of the selection process that we've seen for parliamentary candidates has been reported by Michael Crick and basically, basically by no one else apart from us. Nothing, no reporting on this stuff whatsoever. And I think it's really a damning indictment on the failure of journalism in this country mm. to be impartial to properly scrutinise what's going on at the, the, the highest echelons of our democracy, the future government that's coming into power. Really concerning stuff here. It is hugely concerning. And before I uh, move on, I want to say, if you want to help build a new media for different politics, if you want to scrutinise these people, hold them to account, which my goodness we're going to have to do if, uh, if and when, let's be honest, Keir Starmer en enters 10 Downing Street, I want you to go to navarramedia.com slash support and help us build that new media from politics. Um, you can become a monthly supporter. You can make a one-off payment. It can be £1 a month. It can be £101 a month. I don't know what your finances look like. I'm jealous if you can afford that, uh, that second sum. But help us do that because I've said this to a lot of people. You know, I'm repeatedly asked, what are you going to do when there's a Labour government? Isn't that the end of Navarra Media? Complete opposite. Because I think that we have a level of integrity and credibility on holding a Labour government to account that, frankly, the right-wing media doesn't have and the liberal establishment doesn't have. You know, the Guardian, bits of the BBC won't be critical of Labour because basically it's their people. And meanwhile, you've got people like the Mail, the Sun. They're not going to be fair either because they want them out. It's very partisan. It's very polarised. So if you want fair, honest critique of that Labour government, I think there'll be very few places where you'll get it other than the Vara Media. You know, we are looking at potentially, and this is worth thinking about, the most left-wing government this country's seen since 1979. Potentially. It might not be. There's a good chance it might not be, but it, it could be. It could be the most left-wing government since 1979, which is a hell of a lot about politics in this country. But it's true. But at the same time, there's also a real chance that on issue after issue, there is a huge drift right. And actually, forget the Labour membership, what the public thinks on things like public ownership of water, mail, and rail uh, is discarded as irrelevant, unimportant, stupid. Help us keep all of those issues at the top of the political agenda. Go to navarramedia.com slash support. The link is in the description below. When you think of London... What comes to mind? Maybe it's Big Ben, or perhaps it's the winding River Thames, or maybe it's glistening skyline or world-beating cultural institutions. There's its history, of course, Shakespeare's Globe, there's St. Paul's, and the city's venerable pubs. I personally don't think you can beat a pint at the prospect of Whitby when it's raining, particularly if it's a nice porter. Well, that's what normal people generally think of London, but not the Tories. London, a city steeped in history, but tonight its ancient streets bear witness to a different tale, a tale not of kings and queens, but of crime and desperation. It is a city now run by the Labour Party. Its police answer to them. It is a blueprint for how Labour intend to run the rest of the country, if you let them. In the depths of these narrow passageways tread squads of ULEZ enforcers dressed in black, faces covered with masks, terrorizing communities at the beck and call of their labor mayor master, who's implemented attacks on driving, forcing people to stay inside or go underground. Gripped by the tendrils of rising crime, 
London citizens stay inside. The streets are quiet. Quieter at night now than they used to be. A 54% increase in knife crime since the Labour mayor seized power has the metropolis teetering on the brink of chaos. And in the chaos, people seek a desperate reprieve, egged on by the Labour mayor who wants to decriminalize the use of illegal drugs. London's drug death rate is at a record high. But this isn't just London, where Labour are in charge. Crime goes up and justice goes down. For people living life under Labour, like the citizens of London, the scales of justice remain tipped in favour of the darkness, leaving them to navigate the shadows alone. I can honestly say that's the most insane, weirdest political advert I've ever seen. When it pans out to the world, you know, it's like labor world. Nobody, look, nobody labor world. Like, what are you, this is crazy. It's like, it's, I know what's happened there. There's a video producer. They wanted to use that effect and they just wanted to get it in. It doesn't really work. doesn't really make sense. I suppose that doesn't matter because not much made sense there. In terms of the facts, London is a very safe city. It's the fourth, uh, 14th safest city in the world, apparently. I mean, I lived here 15 years. I was fine. I know bad stuff happens, but also... You have to remember eight and a half million people live here. I, I think that's kind of important context. Um, Sadiq Khan has been elected twice. He hasn't seized power. There's a diametric opposite to seizing power undemocratically. That's winning democratic elections. So he's done the opposite of seizing power. He's, he's won legally. Thirdly, the police don't answer to the Labour Party or to the mayor. They do in part to the mayor. But ultimately, the Metropolitan Police Service is answerable to the Home Secretary. You might have noticed that's a Conservative for the last 14 years. And on you, Les, that's enforced by cameras and computers, not by black-clad masked enforcers or people in balaclavas or thugs. Even more hilariously, the Tories first published a version of that video that contained footage from a totally different city. It showed a scene of a stampede in the New York City subway and claimed it was London. When they got found out, they quickly edited uh, that video before republishing a version that we just showed you there. For what it's worth, a Tory candidate for London Mayor, Susan Hall, has said the video has nothing to do with her and was created by Conservative Party headquarters. It's nothing to do with me. It was just created by the political party I'm standing for. Uh, in response to that Tory fever dream, a London mayor, Sadiq Khan, said this, I love our city. London is such an amazing place. It makes me angry that the governing party, the Tories, are talking down our capital. It's unpatriotic. How can they aspire to lead a city they don't even seem to like? It's a great point. I personally think we need to give other cities in this country the same level of infrastructure as London. I want Leeds to have a tram. I want Bristol to have a subway. But that doesn't mean you make stuff up about London or hate on it. It's a great place. It has a lot going for it. If they sorted out housing here, it would genuinely be one of the best places in the world, in my view. Helena, I don't like the claim that elections are won from the centre. Firstly, it's not always true. Uh, secondly, the centre can change over time. But it's fair to say that if you want to govern a major country like the UK, you should at least try to look normal. I actually think that this is not what the Conservatives think. I think there is a market here specifically. I think it's more of a more worrying trend. We've seen a lot of the you know, 15 minute city conspiracy theory panic coming from members of the Conservative, or even front bench as well as some back benches as well. I'm talking about all the scary, U.S. totalitarian state that Sadiq Khan is ushering in. And I think that there is a certain section of the public that can be swayed by this. The people who are scared about the crime of London, the people who think about all the encroachment of what the expanding of cities takes their kind of rural area that they live in, for example, scaring people about the perspective of what it might be like if they were like London. And of course, talking about the, the ULS cameras being, you know, all part of this kind of anti-motorist campaign, which is, to be, is a lot of this, is funneled through the kind of think tanks and to get people into this 15 minutes conspiracy theory kind of pipeline. There's a really great philosophy tube video that was just released discussing this very thing that I highly recommend people go and watch, where there's, there's this 
there's a certain section of the public who've been kind of taken over by conspiratorial thinking. It's about World Economic Forum, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you create these kind of very strange adverts to kind of play on people's fears, it's kind of like the Nigerian print scam emails. Like if you, know, you want to filter out a lot of the people who wouldn't ever actually want to engage with something that's this kind of what looks very unserious, but could be serious to some people. And broadly, you think, oh, well, why are they bothering? Why are they bothering? The election's over for mayor. And it's true, the election is basically over for mayor. Susan Hall is an incredibly bad candidate. Their second choice, by the way, behind somebody who was accused of groping somebody. That's, that, that's how low the candidacy is, is now for the Conservative London mayor election. And so that's basically over. But you'll notice it was all about Labour run London, Labour run London. We'll mention Sadiq Khan, but it's really actually more about the national picture, as well as all of this specific kind of conspiratorial nature about like ULEs and what, what the, the scary crime of the inner cities looks like. But on top of that, broadly, the Conservative Party know the one place where they usually pull ahead of labour on is on law and order and crime and punishment and things like that. So trying to make the microcosm of London, which isn't actually true, it's a kind of a, a kind of popular lie about how dangerous London specifically is internationally, whatever it might be, and saying, well, if you elect labour nationally, it might be like what we are telling you that London is like. That might be their way of being able to get into this. Although it is quite funny that it does remind me a lot of the kind of campaigning that Sack Goldsmith engaged in to when he was trying to be London mayor. And also it kind of dovetails into what Lee Anderson was saying as well, by trying to paint London as this city within a city or this, this place outside of England, where, of course, most people in London understand this kind of multicultural city that a lot of people live in, but the way they've been painting like the, the continual marches, for example, the Palestinian marches as being the, the scary extremists, it's very clear they're trying to create this image of what London looks like and then using that as a campaign message for everybody else outside of that, essentially to play on the fear reflexes of people who are natural Tory voters who might leave them on you know, literally everything else that they failed on they can't run on anything else, can they? It's also funny to me, they say um, in the ad, they want to decriminalise drugs. Well, I feel like the person that made this video is on drugs. So I don't know what that tells me um, about their recreational habits. There's a great book by a gentleman called Richard Hofstadter. He talks about the, the emergence of the paranoid style in American politics, deeply connected to the emergence of a, a new kind of conservatism in post-war America. And for me, that, that video just encapsulates the paranoid style. But a few things. Look, firstly, the Tories have only ever won the London mayor with one guy, Boris Johnson, right? This, is, this role has existed now since the early 2000s. It's only been won by Ken Livingston, Boris Johnson, Ken Livingston multiple times, Boris Johnson multiple times, Sadiq Khan multiple times. They didn't win it with this kind of campaign. And I, I hear what you're saying, Helena. They're, they're priming the electorate for a, a series of messages that are actually national, not focused on London. But I find it strange. You win London against, by the way, a very formidable outfit with Ken Livingston. You win with Boris Johnson on positivity, a bit of banter fundamentally, not going to change anything. He, he was talking about what a great place London is. It's the centre of the world. Your candidate for London mayor is part of a campaign saying how shit London is. And I do think, actually, this is a broader problem for the Conservatives going forward, right? It's a real problem if you're saying how bad everything is when you've been in charge for 14 years. You can do that when you're the opposition. When you've been the party of government for one and a half decades, it's less easy. And by the way, people also don't like a Debbie Downer. Sometimes they like a smile and somebody to say something positive. I think, by the way, that's a big problem for right-wing media in this country. As much as they're growing, you know, GB News wants to overtake BBC and Sky by 2028. I think they probably will. I think they'll certainly overtake Sky News. Um, you have to be positive because the negative stuff only goes so far. There's enough negativity out there, people. We all know that. I mean, sometimes I worry about Navarro Media. I think we stay positive. We had a good laugh with this last story anyway. Uh, Helena, thanks for joining me this evening. Always a pleasure. Really enjoy our shows together and I look forward to the next time as well. I think you're great. I think you're one of the best co-hosts we've got, if not the best. Uh, don't tell anybody else I said that, though. Uh, and thanks to all of you for tuning in this evening. Make sure to come back tomorrow at 6pm. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.